there, para peeps, and welcome to another episode of Our Haunted Travels Behind the Haunting. I am your host, Sean Donnelly. I'm your co-host, Marianne Donnelly. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the Lincoln Funeral Train that is also a ghost train. What? It's a ghost train, too? So corny. I know. Sorry. <sighs> Thank you all for joining us. I hope you are having a great evening. I hope you have your coffee ready or your tea. That was the opening of our podcast, which we haven't done in a long time. We haven't done that time. in a very long time. We haven't done that in a very long time. Actually, the last time you did it, you said, it's been a while since we did this. We're going to do this every week again. <laughs> and then we haven't didn't do one since. since. Those poor people in our, in our podcast, they're going, where's the next episode? <sighs> I'm just saying. It's nice to see all of you here, though, tonight. So, hello to all of our fans in the house tonight. I don't know what happened. What do you mean you don't know what happened? After we had dinner, we oh. were both just like... Out. Well, I told you before dinner, I was cold, I was tired. And so, you know, I was filled up. almost missed Kay's live stream. I, I did miss Kay's live stream. You did miss Kay's live stream. <laughs> you were out. You were out. All right, we have 11 in the chat. Would you like to do a roll call? Sure. Let me get on that. All right, so we have Air Bear M, which I probably mispronounced. Uh, Brendan Berger, Happy Trails Hiking, Inspired John, Lori Bryant, Lori Marty, Marty's crew, Our Family Adventures, Patricia Faulkner, Ron A., Ronnie Oakley, Teresa Gregory, Gregory, I can't believe I mispronounced she's not, that. She's not awake yet. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, Teresa Gregory and Annette Reagan is here as well. And did you do Shadow oh, Punk 80? I did not. And we also have, now that I've flipped back over, Valkyries here. Nice to see you. Grand Rapids Ghost Hunters, Gilbert Rod, and you said Shadow Punk 80. So, uh, oh, and Air Bear M said I got it right. Yay! All right. All right. All right. If you are new to our channel, let me explain the craziness we have going on over here at what's the name? Let's see. Panic. What's Panic D videos? Panic D videos are on and travels now. It's Panic D Paranormal History. Either way, Sean and Marianne Donnelly, owners of PanicD.com and DarkShadowGhostTours.com. PanicD.com is a database of over 800 locations across the United States and territories that have paranormal claims. Inside that database, we document the history, any ghost stories and folklore, paranormal claims, and any evidence to either prove or debunk those claims. In November of 2017, we started a series called Our Haunted Travels because we have been to over 200 of those locations that are in the database, and that number keeps growing. I don't know how many we're going to hit next weekend, but I am very excited. Love going to new locations. Mm -hmm. It's not to a point like, okay, new locations, we're going to make videos. It's not to that point yet. <laughs> but uh, So that's basically Our Haunted Travels and Panic D and Panic D videos and whatever our name is this week. <laughs> <sighs> this video tonight is a series that we call Behind the Haunting. And we always tell people in, in the beginning of our videos, well, we try to remember to tell people in the beginning of our videos, if you are in to the paranormal history or forensic type videos, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and don't forget to ding the little bell so that you can hear from us the time we post a new video and you don't miss a thing. That's right. So this tonight is one of those forensic type videos. We are going to go deep, deep, deep into the Lincoln Funeral Train. Yes, and actually tonight we're not going to even go as deep as we possibly could because we're, we're gonna going stop. to Yes, we're going to stop at, the, at when they reach Springfield and we're not going to exactly tell you every little tidbit of every single time women no. entered the train and delivered flowers forever, and things and like ever that. And ever. So but, we uh, scaled it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, scaled it down to what about 60 slides? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So before we get rolling, uh, before we, does anybody have any questions so far before we get started? 
Uh, I'm not sure about questions yet. I will catch back up here in the chat, but we did have uh, Well, I see Tanya Lambert's a question. It says, are there any in Missouri that you've been to? Yes, we've been to St. Louis. That's right. Uh, Limp Mansion. That's correct. I was going to say we had somebody else that popped into the chat that we didn't say hello to. Uh, and now I've scrolled past it and can't find it. Kay Johnston's here. That wasn't it, but hello okay. to Kay. Uh, it was somebody. Was it a question? No, it was just as somebody was here. But Teresa Gregory did, uh, you know, make fun and say she hadn't had anybody mess up her name before. <laughs> I look Oh, like there it is. Bread. The Sisters Wood. Well, you're wearing red. Is my face red? Look yes, red on you camera. look very red on camera, but so do I. But uh, I'm not. Okay. I think it's just the lighting looks weird today. Oh, but anyways, red. so the sisters Wood is here as well. Well, hello, 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 and welcome. Uh, and Tanya Lambert, I'm not sure if she was here before when we did the hello, hello. Um, so anyways, uh, la, 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 la. <laughs> and Teresa Gregory says that oh, I am the only person allowed to say her name like that. <laughs> All right, so let's do a little bit of house cleaning. House cleaning? I hate cleaning house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, we are live. So there is no editing available. And I apologize ahead of time for when I make a mistake because I will make a mistake. But that is Marianne's number one job to correct me. And she does it very well. Of course I do. Yes, she does. If you get a moment, please just take a second. Go ahead and share this out on your social media. Let people know that the crazy, creepy people are live and doing one of those awesome live streams. See if we get some more people in. If you don't have time, that's fine. We don't care. We've got a great crowd and we'll just... We'll just put on a show for you guys. That's, That's right. Fine. You guys are an awesome group. That's all right. Yeah. So here's how this is going to happen. We're going to present the story, have a discussion. Uh, we'll respond to comments as we try to catch them. But we are doing a presentation, so we're going to try to keep an eye on as much as we can. Um, we're going to have some breaks during the pre uh, presentation and ask you some questions. So What? The viewers have questions? It's almost like it's a lesson. Since we are teachers, there may be a quiz. <laughs> <clears throat> we will ask for your feedback during the presentation. And we ask that after this is done processing, please come back at the end. We're going to leave you a question to answer. Like he said, homework. Homework. <laughs> and also, we started this, I don't know how many of these ago. One ago, two ago, I don't know. I think this is the third one since we, uh, we said it. Yes. During our live streams, if you make a super chat of a dollar or more, we're going to write your name down in the next book that we publish, which is going to be a collection of these behind the hauntings. We're going to mention your name in that book as a thank you. And we're going to do something new. Are we going to do it? Are we doing the cards? Are we doing the cards? I don't like the way you want it set up yet, so I'm not going to agree to anything. All right, so we'll have to talk about that next live. He wants to do something. I wanted to do it before. I actually brought it up before, but I didn't like the way we had done it in the past. I wanted to try something different, and he wants to do slightly different, but I'm still not in agreement with him yet. So Either way, at some point, <laughs> we're coming out with... Haunted location trading cards. Yes. It's just we don't we we're, we're not agreeing on the manufacturing of them. That's the correct. That's correct. So those are coming. I was gonna say if you do five dollar super chat or more, you get the set of the Lincoln Ghost Train cards, which are probably gonna be the first ones that we make. But I guess we're not ready for that just yet. I'm not ready for that just yet. We're not ready for that just yet. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready to get trusty, going? Get, get your book? I'm getting out my trusty little book to mark this stuff down. If That's we right, need Happy to. Trails. K okay. from Happy Trails. Do what the boss says. <laughs> See? She knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Pusha Studio says, is there going to be homework? <laughs> Valkyrie says, Marianne, good news. I passed my PA certification for teaching. Awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yay! Awesome. That's awesome. And what content area were you going to do, Valkyrie? And age level, I guess. I kind of think I remember it, but I've forgotten. Like, I don't remember. 
remember. But that's awesome. And Gilbert Rod says, oh, no, I don't have my number two pencil sharpened for homework. No, there's not going to be homework. <laughs> that was a joke. It was a bad joke. Tanya Lambert's telling Pusha, their teachers, there's always going to be homework. That's not your, show them your book. So here's some of the research, some of the research that went into this. You see these little post-it notes? These are things that I already didn't know about the Lincoln train that I found out when I read uh, Mr. Reed's book. So I asked her, how's that book going to go back on the shelf? You're going to pull it, them off of there? I, well, I could do that, or it bends nice. It bends <coughs> nicely, you know, because they're sticky tabs. <laughs> are you going to chuck it in the pile with the rest of them over there and then you file it again? I don't know. Probably the latter. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, Inspired John says, what number president was Lincoln? Well, of course, everybody knows he's our number 16. So uh, number 16 for him. Uh, what else do we have in the chat? Oh, Air Bear answered that for him. Uh, let's see. Timberhill Redbones is here and says, hello. Uh, hello, Tanya, hello, hello. Tanya Lambert says, oh, just a few notes. Yeah, I also had uh, another another uh, book. Uh, it was actually a document that was written up. It's 160 pages long from the National Park Service, etc. Um, who was? Um, it was cetera, actually cetera, et cetera. the United States Department of the Interior. Actually, was part of it as well, and it was the uh, restoration of Ford's Theater. Uh, and I used that for the Ford's Theater some of it this week. Um, cut that way down too <laughs> and of course well, it does talk dissertation and i and i didn't even tell them about all the like sizes of different things and everything you know but uh anyways uh the lady vamp says i need a better tab system wow and john inspired john says just checking your credentials <laughs> yeah if i didn't know he was number 16 that would be a problem <laughs> well hopefully everyone in here tonight's going to learn that something a little new uh, that you may have never heard about the uh, funeral train before. Has anyone ever heard about the funeral train? Um, basically, it lasted from, let's see if I get these dates right, April 16th. Am I right? Well, it depends on where you're starting. Assassination was on the 14th. Assassination was the 14th. April 17th. April. When did it leave? It left Washington April 21st. Like I said, April 21st, <laughs> uh, April 21st to May 2nd. 3rd. May 3rd. That's why she's here. <laughs> so that's how long it took the train to go from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois. Correct. Yes. yes. Have you heard of this before? Uh, yes. And Spire yes. John, Lori yes. Bryant, and Marty's crew said yes, they have. And welcoming uh, PMDB Entertainment. And also Riser's, uh, oh, just slipped and I forgot the rest of his name. Riser's Treasure Hunting Emporium. Uh, it's nice to see you again, too. Welcome, 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 yes. everybody. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tanya Lambert says there is a theater in Concordia, Kansas, uh, that has, uh, that is a replica of Ford's Theater, uh, Brown Grand Theater, and it's supposed to be haunted. There's another one we're going to be talking about on Friday's video, too, that's in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. It was designed after that one. Okay, you ready? Are you all situated? I'm ready to go. Ready to go? All righty. Are you guys ready in chat? You ready to get going? Ready to get rolling? Did Lincoln himself believe in ghosts? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Okay. He's going to be cryptic. Okay. Yeah, that's right. going to be part of the presentation a little bit. Okay. And Air Bear says yes, and buried on May fourth, the first time. <laughs> first time. Yeah, there were several. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right, I think we're ready. Right. Ready, teachers. Ready, ready, ready. All, All right. right, here let's, we go. Let's go. The Lincoln funeral train. <laughs> You're so all right. So here's the agenda for the presentation. We're gonna talk about Lincoln's dream. Mm. Okay, uh, that fateful day, 
be, what happened before the funeral, uh, the funeral begins, the funeral train, the arrival in Springfield, the United States, which was the name of the funeral car. And we'll end up with, with the, the ghost, ghost sightings. sightings. Yeah. So that sounds pretty cool. Uh, all right. So let's start off with Lincoln's Dream. Let me let's see. I think we're good here. So I'm going to bring that up. There we go. So we're going to try this just being on camera and not doing this, right? Yes? Sure. We'll go back and forth. We'll go back and forth. We'll go back and forth because there's pictures we'd like to show off as well. All right. So April 4th. That's not right. Oh, no, that is right. About April 4th, 1865, (laughs) Abraham Lincoln started having a reoccurring dream. He envisioned. Now, this is this is not the first premonition type dream. Correct. That he was having. He was having them in Springfield too, um, before they left for Washington when mm-hmm. he was president elect. So the question was, did he believe in ghosts? Not really. He really didn't believe in. Let's call it spiritualism, but his wife did big time. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he would he would tell Mary Todd about these dreams and she would kind of somewhat interpret them or consult with mediums and things like that he didn't really buy into it but he just kind of like went along with with her yeah and he did participate in seances with her <coughs> so yeah but whether he had a belief in it right yeah yeah doesn't know but he had a, a vision of walking into the east room of the white house and noticed a covered corpse laying uh, by uh, and being guarded by soldiers surrounded by a crowd of so- sobbing mourners. Have you guys heard of this before? This is one of his paranormal experiences, basically. Um, Most of them should have, because I believe we mentioned it one time before. Did we? Mm-hmm. Long time ago, though, wasn't it? Not all that long ago. It was when we were doing the White House. Oh, did we talk about the dream then? We did mention his uh, okay. dreams in the White House. I don't know. I don't. I don't remember what I had for lunch. Okay. Um, it was a salad. Okay. Uh, he would ask, "Who is dead in the White House?" And a soldier would reply, "The president. He was killed by an assassin." Now he started having that dream April fourth. That's correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to move on to the fateful day. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. Unfortunately, it turned out to not be quite such a good Friday. Uh, It was around Easter time, and uh, it just so happened to fall on Good Friday itself uh, when the shooting uh, happened. Um, Are you going to do a timeline? or? Yeah, sure, we can do that. Or do you want me to do a timeline? You can do it. All right, I'll I'll do it. You watch chat. Yeah, I'm trying to do it a little bit. All right, so April 14th, 1865, like Marion said, it was Good Friday, Mm -hmm. uh, 10.30 a.m., A messenger from the White House was sent to reserve the presidential box for the Lincolns and General Grant uh, to Ford's Theater. Uh, This was also published in a newspaper, two newspapers actually, um, at 2 p.m. In the 2 p.m. newspaper, it said that President Lincoln would be attending Ford's Theater that night with General Grant. It's kind of something to think about. So here's the President of the United States and his number one general that just won the Civil War. Published in the paper, they will be attending that theater that night. Hmm. All right. But, however, Grant ended up not attending due to an illness that came up in his family. That's right. Uh, but before we move on, there is a question in the chat, and uh, Ronnie Oakley, we are going to hit that that question tonight. So if you stick with us, you will hear the answer what to your question. question. Where's the train at now? Oh, yeah, you will hear that here tonight. Um, okay, so 13 other, 13 other invitations were sent out to attend with the president after Grant canceled. And most of them turned him down. Yeah. Turned him down going to the theater turning... with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Ugh. I just don't know. If the, president, like... if the president says, hey, you want to go to the theater tonight? I think I'd find a way to do it. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. 
So one of them that uh, turned it down was the Speaker of House, uh, Schuler Colfax. Now yes. that name's going to come up here again. It will come back okay. up tonight. Uh, he was eventually Grant's vice president, mm -hmm. and his wife, they turned him down. And his son, Robert, okay, so there's that, uh, well, Timeless. Yes. Showed Robert. The the seri the TV series, Timeless. Timeless. Showed Robert at the thing, and I think, yeah, but um, Robert did not go to the theater that no, night. No, he did not. No. Yeah. Um, so between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., John T. Ford personally decorated. Now, John T. Ford was the owner of Ford's, Ford's theater. theater, not related to Henry Ford. Okay. Maybe, well, probably distantly. Maybe distantly. I don't know. But yeah, but not, definitely not, not the yeah, same. Not, not the same, same. family. Yeah. Okay. But he personally decorated and prepared the presidential box. He sent his worker, Peanuts Burroughs, mm -hmm. to his apartment to get the upholstered rocking chair and other items that was the president's favorite. Yes, the the, the rocking chair that President uh, Lincoln was actually shot in did not even belong to Ford's theater itself. It belonged to Mr. Ford. That's right. Yeah. And we haven't done, did that video yet, but right. we could talk about that here just real quick. That chair it still exists today. It it's does. actually at uh, the We've Henry Ford it. Museum. Up in Michigan, we did go and see that. That for, mm -hmm. that chair does exist. And the reason why it exists is because it was... Confiscated. You're going to let me finish my sentences? I was going to just let us play together. If you, if you need to finish my sentences, I'll do one of these. Um, <laughs> it was confiscated as evidence, and it ended up sitting in a storage facility. They think it was like a worker's area or somewhere in the Smithsonian for years. And John T. Ford's wife was trying to get the chair back. Yeah, she was actually suing the government to get yes. it back. Yeah. So finally she did get it back, and this was during the Depression, so they were looking for money. Henry Ford bought the chair from her. That's right. Yeah, so that's an interesting little story. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so Tad Lincoln, Yes. he complained that nobody ever asked him to go to the theater. Yeah, their their little boy. Yeah, the he little he boy. wanted he wanted to go to the theater, and they didn't invite him. Yeah, but he did get to go to the theater. He did go night. to the theater, but he went to a more children appropriate play. Yes, the he uh, did Aladdin not. and the Wonderful Lamp at yes. uh, Grover's Theater, a few blocks from the Ford's Theater. And I just like to thank Pusha Studios for the super chat. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, well, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate it. That. Let's see. I have to do this one is Lincoln's Ghost Train. You continue on. Okay. So, when leaving for the theater, late as usual, <laughs> yeah. Lincoln turned to his assistant and told him goodbye. And he never did that before. Yeah, it wasn't something that he did. You know, normally he'd just, you know, head out. Yeah. Uh, but for some reason that night, he actually told him goodbye. Yeah, he actually told him goodbye. Um, at uh, 8.30 p.m., the president and Mrs. Lingen, along with Major H.R. Rothorn and Miss Clara Harris, which was his fiance, entered the theater through the second door of the lobby. Uh, John F. Parker was the one who was assigned to guard the president that night. Yeah, and as we Tanya know... Tanya Lambert, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, and as we know, he didn't quite protect him very well that night. No, he did not. No, he did not. Um, as they approached the box, Lincoln paused and bowed to the audience because as you walk up to that president box, it's like you see them walking through the balcony and the audience started to wrestle, oh, the president's here and everything. And yeah. he stopped and bowed. And at that point, the uh, orchestra conductor his name was William Withers that's right stopped the play stopped everything and they started playing hail to the chief that's right so as hail to the chief was being played and this was one of the little argument flare-ups we were having last night okay <laughs> in most pictures and everything you depict you see John Wilkes Booth coming in right behind the president that is door number seven the presidential party all then went into door number eight. 
that presidential box in Ford's Theater was two boxes. That's right. And they t- took down a temporary wall every time the president would come and expand the box. Yeah, because he would usually bring other people with him. And so uh, they would take the two boxes and turn it into one. And it was something that they regularly did. Uh, so it was a removable wall. It was a removable wall. Yeah. So there were two doors into that box. Correct. Okay. So Parker sat outside the entrance of the door, but shortly left his post to head over to the saloon for a quick drink. (laughs) Lincoln did not like having a bodyguard anyway, so he figured that would be okay. Yeah, and actually he was the only one who was permitted to come uh, and to, to be with him. Uh, for for whatever reason, Lincoln, he wanted to be a man of the people, and he n- did not like having all of those people around him all the time. So um, he would let he would eventually let one one of them come, and well, he wasn't quite disur- disturbed that he wasn't hanging with them constantly. Yeah. So at 9 p.m., actor John Wilkes Booth, you guys heard of him before, I hope, <laughs> rides up to the back door of the theater on a roan mare. Yes, a roan-colored mare. Roan-colored mare. Booth hopped off his horse and called for Ned Spangler, who was the stagehand that night, and asked if he would if he could cross over the stage. He was told no, but he can cross under the stage, uh, and was escorted across. Yet through Val the basement. Curie, thank you very much. Through the basement, right? Thank you, Val. Thank you. Um, now you remember. The, the gentleman that went up to get the chair and all that stuff? Peanuts? Mm-hmm. All right. Spangler got peanuts. Oh, and we have another one for oh, Riser Treasure Riser Honey. Thank treasure you. Riser Treasure Honey and Thank you very much. So Spangler got peanuts to hold Booth's horse. Mm-hmm. I know, right? You Originally, I, to, I had, when I had mentioned to you that <laughs> Peanuts was holding the horse, you said... Now, why wasn't Peanuts, like, you know, arrested and stuff? Well, yeah. Peanuts just worked for the theater. He was told, hey, hold this. He's like, okay. <laughs> and he held it. Sure. So. Not a problem. So, I, I want to point out, and we don't have this here, but I just want to kind of like, so you understand, okay? Booth worked there at the theater. He was a working actor. And that would not have been... Abnormal for him to just kind of show up. There you go, finishing my sentences. Sorry. Yeah, I would, get excited about this stuff. It wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been strange for him to show up and say, "Hey, I'm just going to run in," like he was going to check his mail or get his paycheck or whatever it was. Yeah. I mean, that happened all the time, and everyone knew Booth, so it was like, "Oh, okay, whatever." All right, let me get caught up here. I'm behind, I think. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. So, Booth then proceeds to the same saloon that the guard is at. He sure does. Okay? The gentleman that's supposed to be guarding the president, he goes over to the same saloon and gets a drink of whiskey. Yep. So, they were both in the same room at the same time. All yep. right. <laughs> you can imagine the conspiracy theories going off from that one right there. But anyway, shortly after 10 p.m., he returns to the theater checks his time against the lobby clock. Now, this is kind of an important thing, too, because Booth knew the play. Oh, absolutely. I don't know what you just did. Oh, I tried to push enter. Go ahead. Okay, Booth knew the play, and uh, he knew the timing just right when there was going to be a pause and a loud laughter of scene two, act three. So he quickly enters the pathway to the presidential box and bars the door with a pre-made bar. He enters the darkness of the box and maneuvers his way behind the president. Now, I found this picture. We know this is a doctored picture because several different reasons. Yes. (laughs) Number one, that camera couldn't be up that high, especially the size of the cameras at the time. But anyways, this is actually a pretty cool picture. It's pretty cool. Um, so that kind of depicts the scene. That And that's actually the placement of where everyone was at at that fatal moment. That's right. Um, he ended up, Lincoln ended up going to the theater that night with the Rathbones. And uh, I think we have information about that later. But um, I'll just throw it in here now since you have the picture up. Um, 
Lincoln was on the side closest to the audience in the in the box, mm-hmm. uh, and then seated next to him would be, of course, his wife Mary Todd, and then uh, in the other side or the other box, uh, you had Mr. Uh, Rathbone uh, and his girlfriend, uh, and um, she was actually uh, a relative, uh, and I forget her last name. Uh, but she was actually a relative of uh, one of the other uh, individuals in um, in the Senate, I believe. Uh, but they were sort of an item. So, yeah. Okay. There's something I want to I, I, I want to mention too that's not in the presentation that I kind of like, you know, put together, which is kind of sad. The entire Lincoln presidency. Yeah. I mentioned this to you a while ago. Mm-hmm. He did not have one full week in office where that war wasn't going on. It actually uh, broke out the first week he took office, and this took place three days after the surrender. Which, by the way, really wasn't the total end of the Civil War because only General Lee surrendered um, the the first army of virginia three days before this so the other generals had to surrender too which would have put an end to the civil war but he was just out relaxing that night <laughs> you know right chilling out which is it's kind of sad that's that's really kind of sad but if you think about you know keep that in mind mm-hmm. as we as we go through this stuff all right so to continue forward um so the shot rings out um Rathborn leaps forward to his feet to try to capture Booth. He gets stabbed twice. Yeah, Booth jumps Rathbone. to the stage, and during his getaway, well, he jumps to the stage, he lands wrong, breaks his leg. Um, during his getaway, getaway, he actually stabs the uh, conductor, William Withers. Mm-hmm. And that's something I just found out when we were doing this presentation. I didn't know that he got hurt, too. Mm-hmm. Um, Charles Leal, a young army surgeon, pushed his way through the crowd to the door of Lincoln's box and found it would not open because it was barred shut. So Rathborn, wounded, goes over and uh, takes the bar off the door and lets him in. Another physician, Charles Sabin, Sabin Taft, was lifted up from the stage into the presidential box. Um at first, they thought Lincoln was stabbed. Right. They they were looking for a stab wound, and they and they you know ripped open his shirt, and they're looking around, and they just couldn't find a wound. So then they started looking elsewhere, and yeah. uh, it was it's what, that's when that they point, found, they the, found uh, the wound yeah they found the head. gunshot wound yeah. in the left ear, and the bullet was too deep to be removed. Now this is something. Okay, this is this is a little warning. So if it fits too gross for you, you know earmuffs. <laughs> but um, they found out that if they would remove the blood clot that was starting, he would be able to breathe better. And basically, what that meant was, is the blood was. Uh, it was starting to. It was starting pool, to swell so his brain, and it was making his pressure in, was increasing. Yeah. Right. So. What are you got going on over know. there, Mr. Donnelly? I don't think it'll do it again, I hope. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. So, uh, anyways. Not a good time to pause. But anyways, Lincoln had to, uh, he had to be moved. They knew that he had to be moved. Mm-hmm. and But they felt that the carriage ride back to the White House would have just been too, too fatal for that. So they carried him. It was raining out. Uh, the soldiers carried him out into the rain across the street to the Petersons' house. Now, we're going to talk about Peterson's house next Friday. Um, not going to do a ghost stories of folklore because the only thing is is the apparition of Abraham Lincoln. But Tuesday, I'm going to do the ghost of Abraham Lincoln and mention Peterson's house. But okay. anyways, it's right across the street. If you've never been there, um, they said, yeah, sure, bring him over here. And the story is true. The bed was too small for him to fit on. He, he you know, his, leg, his legs dangled off the bed. But throughout the night, they kept removing that clot to relieve the pressure um, so that he could breathe better. And then, unfortunately, the next morning at 7.22 a.m., Lincoln was pronounced dead. Yes. Now, uh, on the 150th anniversary of 
this evening. Uh, the National Park Service uh, and Peterson House, which is owned also by them as well, uh, and Ford's Theater, they, they basically cut off the road uh, there out in front between the two buildings, uh, and they reenacted what happened when it happened. And uh, so they would, they actually came out of, of the building and announced, you know, that he had died and everything like that. And I thought it was really cool. And they did stream that on their Facebook channel. So I had been watching that at the time. That was really cool. Um, but you were showing a picture of Peterson House, uh, mm -hmm. and this is not a true photograph this was a painting, was like a painting that was done interpretation yeah uh because that room <coughs> is nowhere near big enough for no. all of those people to be in it at once these nowhere are all close. this is just an interpretation of all of the people who had visited that time period from when he was there in uh the uh peterson house doctors surgeons uh military, military officials people were coming in and out and in and out and they were trying to save him but it was just not going to happen. All right, so we got some things here in the chat to talk about. Oh, oh, oh the windows chimes. What was that noise? Oh okay, gosh. so here's what the problem is. I need to re reboot, uh, reboot the computer. <laughs> I forgot to do that before we went live. Yeah. So it's telling me, you got updates, you got updates, you got updates. Yeah, Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, Tom, Tanya Lambert I saw says, that. Tanya, Tanya oh my Lambert gosh, says I'm so dog sorry. Jumped. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we have a question for you guys in chat. Yeah, they've been having a couple of questions for us, too, and I kind of was answering those along the okay, way. Okay, so what's the questions? Is there more? Uh, no, I've been sort of answering those kind of a, a little bit along the way as time was going. You were doing a wonderful job, um, but I did, uh, Irish Whiskey wanted to know if there were almonds in the bar. I don't know. It maybe. was a wooden bar. It wasn't a chocolate bar. I saw them <laughs> say I like chocolate bars. So, I don't know. Maybe. Could be. Uh, but, yeah, I'm bar. sure there was some sort of snack. Uh, at the bar too <laughs> okay so here is the question what was the name of the play that was going on during lincoln's assassination mm -hmm. narrow, 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 narrow. copyright 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 yeah what was the name of the play that was going on during lincoln's assassination i thought i I know the answer to this. I am looking, though. I thought somewhere in this document there was actually one of the broadsides, a picture of one of the broadsides uh, about that evening. Should have probably bookmarked that in here. No. Oh, well. I guess Our I American can't. cousin. Well, I knew that. Oh, that, that was answered. Oh, somebody answered it. <laughs> <laughs> Our American cousin is right. Okay. Yes. Yes, it was. So I think Kay's still here. Look. There you go, Kay. Half of that one's already gone. <laughs> uh, Lori was close, my favorite cousin. I think it's our. Yeah, it's our. Our, Ameri our yeah, American it's our. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our American cousin, which was the last play to be in Ford's Theater for a hundred and some years. A hundred and three years. Yeah. Um, Never finished. Yeah. True. I don't see that broadside, but oh well, that's okay. They can they can look for All right, it. You want to cover this part? Uh, sure. <coughs> or say that painting does make me think about the Last Supper. Does it? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's talk a, a little bit about the time between uh, when he was pronounced dead at the um, Peterson House until the actual funeral itself. So now we're talking about before the funeral. Yeah, so Next if you're following section. along with the agenda for the day. Um, oh, gosh, Robert Gil Gilbert Rod. He wanted my to favorite my Martian. Favorite Martian. <laughs> oh, goodness <laughs> gracious. All right, so before the funeral, within an hour of being pronounced dead, Lincoln's body was actually moved from the <laughs> Peterson house back to the White House. And it was at the White House that they actually performed an autopsy. Uh, so it was performed, and um, he was actually the first president, of course, we know, uh, that had embalming done. So he, he was autopsied, and then uh, he was embalmed. Now, Joseph Woodward, uh, and he was assisted by Eric Curtis, 
performed the autopsy and it was done in the guest room in the northeast on the second floor of the white house and um it was it was quite interesting uh how how they actually went ahead and did that and um i had some descriptions but i'm not sure that we, we should have showed the pictures we should have showed the pictures that. uh the some of the materials uh, Mr. Curtis, by the way, Edward Curtis, his um, his cuffs on his shirt, um, they were soaked in Lincoln's blood. And when he went home, his wife took it upon herself to cut those off of his sleeves and say, we need to keep these. And they are now on display at the uh, Military History uh, of the Medical Museum, the uh, Medical History Museum uh, in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, actually, uh, and it is a free museum. You can go and see that, as well as the instruments that they used for the autopsy and the bullet fragments, along with some pieces of skull and hair um, from that, that autopsy. She's um, getting excited. I, I am, you know. should have showed the pictures. Should have showed the pictures, yeah. We um, have pictures of it. We have a video out there about it. I keep saying That's it. right, yeah. Uh, and so demonetized by the way <laughs> surprising the bullet, the bullet shocker, that killed shocker, Lincoln shocker. will demonetize you <laughs> yeah uh well in any case um they did drain his blood and Henry Cattell then uh who worked for Brown and Alexander uh went ahead um and embalmed him uh and I believe Curtis helped uh, along with that as well um and the same embalmer uh, was the one who embalmed Lincoln's son, Willie. So that's kind of uh, cool as well. Uh, but I do have copies of um, the information from the autopsy report, uh, and we'll make that available in um, Patreon. Patreon, why not? Uh, Are you going to actually post stuff in Patreon? Oh, I, no, uh, no, because I don't do that. Um, <laughs> that's not Are you going to make it available for me to post in Patreon? Um, actually, uh, yes, I can do that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <coughs> we yeah. will be posting the autopsy yeah. report in, in Patreon. Yeah, so uh, we do have that. Um, what else? Do I, is there anything else I want to say about this? I'm not 100% sure that I do or don't. I think I'm okay. All right. So now April 17th. Yes. This is why I got the dates messed up. That's right. April 17th, the funeral of Abraham Lincoln begins on April 17th, and it ends on May 4th? Yes. April 17th to May 4th. It's a fairly large ceremony. <laughs> yes, he was embalmed, but just saying, he wasn't refrigerated. That's right. Okay. He was not refrigerated. <clears throat> Yeah. All right, so April 17th, go ahead. On April 17th, uh, the body is moved from uh, where he, the room where he was autopsied to lay in state in the East Room of the White House. And of course, if you remember his dream, Lincoln said, who is that lying in state in the East Room? And he was told the president who was shot, uh, who was killed by an assassin. Uh, and uh, so it came to be. Yeah. Uh, then at 11 a.m., and this is the part that really gets me, uh, he is shot on the 14th. He's lingering in a death light state until the morning of the 15th. Now we're on the 17th. Two days later. They finally swear in Andrew Johnson. As the 17th president. At 11 a.m. too. Yes, so it was wasn't even bright and early. Half, two and a half days. It, it's crazy to think that technically, I mean, we, everybody knows, hey, if the president is, is is incapacitated, you know, the next in charge would be the vice president. But we literally didn't have an actual sworn in president for over two days. Yeah. Which is crazy to me. I just can't believe that it took them that long to do that. Uh, but at 11 a.m. on the 17th, uh, they do swear in the 17th president of the United States. Uh, I'll take care of that. All right. Um, let's move on. Uh, you watching that chat there? Because I just yeah. I accepted that one thing like that. 
Um, yep. Gilbert Ron had a question. Um, how well is it preserved? Could they extract his DNA from it? Uh, I don't know about how well it was actually preserved at the time. Now the it's cops? taken care of quite well. Yeah, um, it's probably past the other. Hands. You can get. You could probably get a partial. Yeah. Um, but not, it wouldn't. It would not have survived like uh, to be perfected. The hair, maybe. Uh, the skull would probably be better. The skull yeah. pieces. And by the way, just since we bring this back up, um, the there was a piece of the skull of Lincoln that had accidentally fallen into um, Curtis's um, uh, doctor's bag. And that's one of the pieces that is actually at the museum too. It kind of so he was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> this this fell in." You know, I would take it back. Yeah, yeah. So he he was it, that was accidental. Uh, the cuffs uh, he had the blood, and his wife took care of that. <laughs> but I just thought I'd bring that up now. All right. So on April eighteenth, we'll skip along a little bit here. April eighteenth, um, they do open. Uh, the White House for public viewing of the body in the East Room. On the 19th, we have the funeral services that begin at the White House. Um, and then the coffin is uh, moved by procession to the Capitol building and it goes into the rotunda and they do have a burial service there as well. Uh, on the 20th, the coffin stays and lays in state in the Capitol rotunda the whole day. Uh, on the 21st, very early in the morning, and when I say very early, I mean like probably like three, four in the morning, uh, we're having a prayer service for Lincoln's cabinet. And uh, then at 7 a.m., they're going to take the coffin and they're going to begin movement of that by procession to the train depot for loading onto the funeral train. That's right. So Mark Vernon says, if scientists used his DNA to make a clone, wouldn't it be strange if he ran and became president? That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd vote for him. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> this is an example. Actually, this is D.C. I think Lincoln's procession. Yeah, Washington, D.C. When we use the word procession throughout the rest of the presentation, this is what we're talking about. That is what those processions look like. Yeah. The, at different places around uh, through the, the cities and things would have differing amounts of individuals. Um, but some places had, you know, over 37,000 people who were part of the, the procession itself. That's a lot of people just to be in basically a parade procession, you yes. know? Uh, so it did start there, though. <coughs> This is the east room, east room of the White House. Okay. Mm hmm And um, that's basically what the coffin looked like, if you guys can see that. Yes, it was black. Um, With silver. Uh, kind of trimmings. similar to um, Washington. George Washington's mm -hmm. original coffin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... How are we doing so far? Any questions? Need more coffee? Need more water? Well, you don't get any of that. <laughs> I'm not going to get more coffee. i got two more bottles of water down here. Uh, Irish Whiskey wants to know if anyone has used a spirit box in his bedroom in the White House. Um, I don't know. I, don't I haven't know. heard reports of any type of paranormal investigations in the and, White House. And, and I think when we and talked about, and if they about, did, they probably don't talk about it. Yeah, when we talked about the White House, I think we kind of brought up that you know we would do it in an instant if anybody invited us. Yeah. Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> but that uh, it, it's kind of hard to get in there, and it, and unless they specifically asked you to come in and do that. I don't think that the yeah. Secret Service would really allow much of that. That's a good way to get tackled. It is. It <laughs> is. <laughs> All right. So this begins the funeral train. Oh, and How look. Time? Look minutes. at this. I had this on my lap. I had separated <coughs> it. I didn't even realize it. Here is that uh, picture for uh, the uh, broadside of uh, our American cousin. I don't know if they could see that. That should have been in the presentation. Yeah, but. probably should have been. But oh well, I, I had it sitting on my lap. <laughs> oh well, all right. So 
Alrighty, so on the train, Lincoln's body was accompanied by eight honor guards, a right. funeral director, an embalmer, and his son's Willie. His son Willie. His son Willie. His casket was on there too. Mm -hmm. Robert Lincoln started out with them. But he didn't stay the whole train trip. Do you want to do this? No, age? go ahead. Okay. And 300 other dignitaries that would change in and out at different stops. There was one person who was not on the train and refused to take part in all this grandiose type celebrations. Anybody have an idea who that was? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Chris Mohan, hello. Well, you guys think about it and answer in chat if you know who it was. Mm -hmm. The train was scheduled to pass through 444 towns and cities, uh, stop and be offloaded at 13 major cities or state capitals. Okay. Well, not all not all of them were state capitals. They were most, just major cities. Most were state capitals, but yeah, and major cities. Okay. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't Ugh. go through that many states. Do we agree on a total mileage? 1,662 yes. miles taking the path that Lincoln took on his way to Washington from Spring Springfield. Except for a small change. Yeah, small change. And we're going to ask you that in a second. Okay, so let's see. I, don't, I didn't think so. Tanya Lambert got it. Mary. His wife, Mary, was not on a train and did not take part in any of the funeral ceremonies at all. Yeah. Any of them. Right. She didn't she do the ones to. in Washington. She didn't go to the one in Springfield. She wasn't on the Lincoln train. So she literally participated in none of his funeral services, which is quite interesting. The widow did not attend the services. That's right. Yeah. Another little cool tidbit just thought I'd throw out while you're looking for the next picture there. Uh, on the on the funeral train, we were mentioning some of the people who were on board. Um, Robert Todd Lincoln is the only living Lincoln or relative uh, that was on board. His son Willie was there, but he was dead, mm -hmm. right? Um, Robert was the only one who was alive, and today Robert is the only one of the family that is not buried in Springfield in the Lincoln tomb. That's right. He's buried at Arlington Cemetery. Right. Um, my set is not had a replace today, but are enjoying the stories. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, and Tanya says she did lose a lot of family, <coughs> children, and her husband. That's right. She they she never really recovered after Willie's death. Yeah. Um so this was just so, adding to so it. So Tad and Mary was not on the train. No. No. All right, so this is what these guys these you know did we say how fast? No, we didn't get that. We didn't get far to that yet. Part, but yeah. um, this is inside the car of the train with the president. Yeah, and you'll notice that as we go through this, some of these are like drawings. Yeah, obviously. sketches because um, photography is like fairly new, you know. Right. So they would draw sketches, and, and they had plenty of time. They sure did. Uh, they did, and and some of these sketches uh, did end up in a Har Harper's Weekly uh, newspaper. So. Uh, magazine newspaper so tanya lambert says wasn't she suffering from mental disorders of some sort yes and no okay a lot of people think she just went uh, crazy mm -hmm. all right but that's kind of not true mary todd lincoln had a carriage accident and it was a misdiagnosed concussion what do we know about concussions now you know, as as people get co concussions and, and, you know, like the football players and stuff like that, over time, their mind, it's potentially their mind can go. So it was like later after this when she started not being well, okay? And the reason why we know that, we asked the question when we were in Springfield at the Lincoln House, and we asked that same question, that specific question, because they mentioned that she wasn't on a train or not. And they said, no, at the time, she was upset and distraught over the death of her husband and lost a son and, you know, that kind of thing. But she was very adamant that she just wanted to get her family and her husband back to Springfield. 
I, I don't want to deal with all this stuff and they they shouldn't have did this to the president and that kind of thing and that that was she was she yeah she did very determined and she was adamant that they weren't stubborn, even going to do but, the funeral train she right. did not want to have all these stops and things like that she just wanted to get them there but she did eventually agree to it right now that's kind of like interesting to think about because Mary Todd Lincoln they they didn't go with her wishes, whereas with JFK, they went with Jackie. Pretty much everything that everything Jackie that said. Everything that Jackie said, they yeah. did. Yeah. You know, so that's that's pretty interesting historical thing right there. All right, so we got another question for you guys. Oh, I thought you were going to say we got another question from the group. That oh, said, okay. Go ahead. I hear chirping. <laughs> yeah, I got the window open. I'm sorry. You'll hear frogs here as soon as the sun goes down. <laughs> yes. Um, but they uh, said uh, also, you know, were, were they afraid that his body would be stolen? And I said, eventually. Okay, so here's the question in chat. Now, Mary Ann said that the trip was changed a little bit. There was two cities that was not <coughs> included in that stop. Right. Uh, in the funeral train, they were trying to uh, <coughs> revisit all of the cities in the opposite direction of how he got from Springfield to Washington. <laughs> But they did leave out two of those cities. Which was Cincinnati, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's right. Those two were left out. So the question is, why do you think they left out <clears throat> Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Anybody know? Anybody have a guest? A guess. Not a guest. A guest. A you guess. have a guest? <laughs> <coughs> Here comes the frogs. <laughs> it might be time to start closing that window. No, it's warm. I'm just saying, they can hear it. <coughs> so I need to apologize to you guys a little bit, too. I'm a little bit out of it. I'm having some uh, throat issues. I had a bad night the other night, and my throat's kind of <coughs> burning at the moment. But... Uh, so anybody crowd problems and eh, kinda you're kind of close getting there yeah uh, they they did end up finding that um there were way more people that came to visit the funeral train along the route than they, than they expected. expected that yeah. that yeah. they did expect some but they did not expect what they got well they believed they meaning the federal government okay and the people that were in charge of the funeral train and getting him back to springfield they were worried about those two cities cincinnati and pittsburgh because they had intelligence as good as it could be back then that there could be confederate sympathizers in those two cities so that could disrupt things. that could have disrupt things so they took those two so cities marty's off crew the got it protests All right protests, protests basically yes. yeah so they were worried that that something could happen in those cities now okay imagine this i showed you guys that picture of that procession okay so imagine all along that path okay people were out along the rails it could have been midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. It didn't matter. The whole train ride, there were people out there. Yeah. When it stopped, you know, 37,000 or some of the numbers, 57,000, 107,000 people. So you can imagine how that train car could have been overran and something could have happened if, if something would have went down very easily. Oh, yeah. Very easily. Very easy. So I, I really don't blame them if they say, hey, this could be bad, you know. And, and, and it's interesting that they would think that because this was the North. And yeah. why would we have so many Confederate sympathizers in the North? And, you know, just understand that people still travel. <laughs> okay, and, so the... And not everybody in the North necessarily agreed with the president right. either. So the train would go no faster than 20 miles an hour. Yeah, they had some rules that they put into place. Um, and they they sort of had some planned... But the the official These writing the official up rules. of the I rules. I don't have that as a heading. But should. the official writing up of the rules didn't actually happen until they actually started riding along uh, on the first leg of the journey. They said, "Oh, we've got some time. Let's sit here and write these out." Okay, so so these are the rules. Yes. Okay, so the train would go no faster than twenty miles an hour. The mm -hmm. preferred speed was five miles an hour. 
and would slow even slower or slower for mourners along the tracks. Yeah. <coughs> um, the whole train would be called the Lincoln Special. Mm-hmm. There was a scout train that was ahead of the funeral train at least 10 minutes ahead to ensure that there, uh, the tracks were clear and there was no signal warnings. There was no, no problems. And if there was, they would signal the other train, hey, stop there where you are. We got some problems. We'll take care of it. We'll know when to come back. Yeah. The train was to have nine cars unless it was uh, planned to be traveling past midnight in which they would add sleeping cars to the train. Right. The Hirsch train... The train that carried the coffins. The there first was train two. car. Yeah, there was two. There was Willie and President Lincoln. Would always be the car right before the caboose. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're, like, into history and looking at history or history pictures and that kind of stuff, that's a cool thing to know because that tells you the direction that the train was going when you're looking at pictures. Okay? Oh, there's the caboose. There's that train. So it's facing that way or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. which direction. Tell you where that picture was taken. Um they would wire ahead via, this is this is interesting, they would wire ahead uh, via telegraph to let stations know they were on their way. And the scout train would not go past the telegraph station unless they already heard that the funeral train was past the previous one. So that's how the two trains stayed together, stayed together and communicated along the path. That's pretty smart. Yeah, so. I thought that was really cool too. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that scout train uh, would be called the pilot train. Um, but basically, it was like a, like a scout, like a military scout. They'd go out and make sure everything was all good before the rest of the crew came. Yeah. So the scout train and fuel train had express rights. So if you know anything about the railroad, you know, railroad system, if a train has express rights, that means, you know, every, all other trains stop until they pass um, on, the, on the tracks while they were in motion. So, you know, moving at five miles, you know, 20 miles to five miles an hour, at that slow pace, I'm sure the whole railroad system came to a screeching halt. But here's the path. This is going to no, get a little nobody bright. else. Nobody else was allowed to be on those tracks. All other train uh, <coughs> travel was was stopped in those areas where he was traveling through. Yeah. Um, so that was like the scout train or the pilot train's thing. Make sure that there is nothing else on those train tracks. This is going to get a little bright. Because this is just It's a white. bright white sh- yeah. sheet. <laughs> so this is actually the path that the train took. It's kind of cut off up there. I apologize for that. I didn't notice that. I could have used a different one. Yes. But it is kind of c- cut off how it arced up around. You know, it wasn't a direct path to Springfield. It took the Clearly path that not. Lincoln took yeah. heading to Washington. Again, so. except for Cincinnati yeah, and which are, Pittsburgh. Here's Pittsburgh here in Cincinnati down here. So there's the two changes. Yeah. There. All right. So it did um, take some time. Uh, so Risers Treasure Hunting has a question. says, was there a designated railroad that carried the president, Baltimore and Ohio, or the Pennsylvania? Uh, Both. <laughs> so, no. Uh, there wasn't a designated railroad. Right. It would pass off. And we're going to talk about that here in a little yeah. bit, too, because there is a misconception yes, about is. the the uh, the train itself. But the cars would stay the same, but they would pass off to the different railroads. Right. And change out engines. Yes. 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 So they would use the engine that was for that specific railroad on the path that they were taking, but the cars would stay the same. Yeah, they allowed the, they, they knew, like they knew that the railroads would want to have their part in it. So they allowed all those changing out of those as they transferred from one line to another. Yeah. All right, so do we have any other questions and we're gonna start, start going through the path and different things that occurred. <coughs> I'm just resting my voice here a second. <coughs> Okie dokie, dear. You go right ahead. All right, you want to do this part? Which? Oh, that part. Start right here. All right. So, uh, we know 
that the train left Washington and was headed to uh, Springfield, Illinois. Uh, and we also know that it was going to go through a whole bunch of places. So where did it stop? Where were big things that happened? It, it traveled, as we said, through over 400 uh, different cities and towns. Uh, and they would be constantly a maraud of people. Just everywhere there was a little town, like everybody from the town would come out and, and come by the train tracks. Even if it wasn't <coughs> going to stop in their town, um, they would come by the train tracks and they would put up displays and banners and you know wave and throw flowers and people would get on. Uh, women, always women, uh, would get on the train <coughs> and deliver fresh flowers around the casket. I can't imagine why, can you? Uh, Lack of refrigeration, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that could be it. Yeah, so President they would Lincoln, come on. You're getting a little gamey. <laughs> they they that would was come bad. on. I'm in, sorry. They would come to, on in. They would come on in different towns, and they would provide uh, new flower arrangements and and things for around the casket. Um, and um, new people would come in and in and out for military personnel and for um, individuals from those states that would come on. Uh, they would have like different individuals from the state who were very important that would come on to the funeral train and be part of it and things like that. So, um, but the first official planned stop. Well, we're gonna before you start doing these, it it stopped or slowed down. 440 different cities. We're only going to cover 13. 13, 13 or 14. Well, the 14th is like Springfield. That, yeah. So we're, we're speeding along the way. So we're going to cover the major ones. Okay, go ahead. The first stop. So the first stop was going to be on the 21st uh, in Baltimore. It was expected to arrive by 10 a.m. Uh, and uh, when they got there, uh, it was... It, you know, before they got there, let's go before they got there, they were surprised at all the towns before they got from Washington, between Washington and Baltimore, all the little towns where there were so many people already, and they had to slow down earlier than they expected. Um, but they did arrive in Baltimore by 10 a.m., and again, way more people were there than they expected. And uh, people stood in line for hours uh, to see the body, and it turned out, they had to turn people away. They turned mourners away so that they can get Lincoln back on the train because at the, some of these stops, they literally took him off the train. They would go and have a, a you know, a, you know, a procession, take him to some important building in the town, uh, and you know, let mourners come by and see him. They opened up the casket. Let well, him. Well, that take was a, a question just asked by Gilbert. How often was the casket open for viewing along the way? Every time they offloaded it. That's why they had it, the embalmer and the funeral director ride with them. Because when they took him off the train, there was like about a half hour to an hour where they prepped. They fixed it fixed up. Fixed it up. They, and then it was an open casket. Yeah. Now, one thing I want to mention as we go through this... Imagine how many people viewed that body, okay? There's only one known picture of Abraham Lincoln in his casket. That's right. Because there was a federal mandate put out that nobody is to take a photograph. And that photo only exists. There's a tintype copy of that. That photo only exists because it was found by accident in a book in the Library of Congress. And that was taken at the White House. They uh, had caught someone taking a photo and they broke the glass plates. Mm -hmm. But apparently... They didn't know he had another one hid. They didn't know that they had it already printed. <clears throat> yeah, so the the honor guards and everyone with them that was one of their jobs was to looking for cameras and that, and that kind and of thing and it was pretty so. easy it wasn't like today where you can stick one in your pocket or something oh, like no. that it was the cameras big. were were big back in those yeah. days you, you know it, you knew about they it. didn't have cell phones going click 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 okay all right go ahead uh, so Marty's Cruz says sounds like a poorly planned dog <coughs> pony show it was actually pretty well planned for as quickly as it happened um but yeah it was pretty much a dog and pony show they they did like they wanted people to see him and um 
well, they wanted as wanted, many people wanted to see him too. and they wanted yeah. as many people to get the chance to see him yeah. uh, and uh, reports were that at least one third of the population of the United States actually did get to see him and remember they only traveled through seven states one third of the entire population of the United States though traveled to go see him in one of these cities so yeah. that was pretty cool um, all right, so uh, they ended up, as I said, in Baltimore having to turn people away who had stood in line for hours, and um, they boxed, you know, sealed his coffin back up, took him back to the train, loaded him up, and then they were off again. So on the 21st, they also, after they left Baltimore, went to York, Pennsylvania, um, and this was the first time that they really had women enter the car and place some flowers around the coffin. This would happen many times after that, but um, we just start kind of told you the first time it happened. Now, on the 22nd, it arrived in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, the body was moved uh, from by the train procession. by procession to the Capitol building. It was placed in the Hall of Representatives, uh, where, again, uh, a maraud of people for hours on end would come and visit. They then uh, moved him to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, they did not stop and offload him. However, uh, former President Chandra Buchanan... Chandra P. was saying goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks Bye, for thanks stopping. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. Um, in Lancaster, former President Buchanan uh, and also Thaddeus Stevens uh, were there to pay their respects as the train passed by them. But they weren't like given any honors or any special spot that they were, you know, close to the train. They didn't get on the train, where a lot of places, um, individuals, were when they stopped in some of these towns, they, they actually let famous people come on the on there, you know, people who were important to this the government. This is the one where, where uh, former President Buchanan sat in his carriage. Yes. Right, and yeah. just removed his hat. Yes, and, yeah. and uh, Thaddeus Stevens stood on some rocks underneath the... Um, one overpass of the train and when the train car uh, that was the funeral hearse car came over he took his hat off and he kind of um, you know bowed his head and then when it passed he put the, his hat back on but n those are two big names back in that time period and uh, they didn't they didn't get any special treatment they were just like any other uh, person that came to pay their respects um, Continuing on, the train, uh, again, didn't stop in Lancaster, didn't stop in several other towns, like stop uh, and offload him uh, along the way. But eventually, on the 22nd, they do get to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, in Philadelphia, now this is really cool to me. Uh, in Philadelphia, they moved his body by procession mm -hmm. to Independence Hall. Now, when it gets to Independence Hall, the casket's placed in the Great Hall, where the the Declaration of Independence was signed. He was in that room, the same room. Uh, and again, people came, stood four to five hours to, to go through there just to see him. Um, and it was placed in there in such a way that his head was where the Liberty Bell had sat for quite a while inside. So that was pretty, pretty cool. So in the room where the Declaration was signed with the Liberty Bell, it's just that... That's just amazing. very ceremonial yeah. and very much so. Yeah. yeah. All right. On to the next. Continuing on, he was there in Philadelphia for a number of hours. And so he came later in the day on the 22nd. He was there on the 23rd. And they moved him back uh, to the train and moved on their way, eventually on the 24th, getting to Trenton, New Jersey. Trenton, New Jersey is going to be the only state capital that they pass through that the train did not stop for a full procession and have him offloaded. They did stop at the train depot, mm -hmm. and 20,000 people were said to have been in attendance and in the vicinity and there to pay their respects and everything, <coughs> but they didn't offload him, and so they were only able to see him from the windows of the train car. I think that was done because they went over in time at Independence Hall, maybe, and they had a scheduled time they had to be at New York. And that's where they were maybe making up some time there. I don't know. It kind of makes sense, though. It makes sense, but at the same time, these cities were all told yeah. that they were going to have um, a formal, a, a formal yeah. uh, visitation 
uh, time with with a body, and I can't see them completely eliminating that. I can oh. see them shortening the time. I just can't see them completely eliminating it. So I don't think that they actually planned for Trenton to have an option to do that. Um, but in any case, uh, they continue on then to New York. Uh, and so on the 24th, the, the funeral train does arrive in New York. The coffin is placed on a hearse and taken by ferry. Yes, you heard that right. His coffin was taken out of the funeral train. It is placed on a, on a, a cavalcade uh, of a... Um, of a hearse car, like a, a drawn ho horse, drawn hearse. They take him and they take him onto a ferry and they ferry him across the Hudson. They do the same exact thing with his funeral train car. The actual train car that he was in. They put that different on a ferry. ferry. Different it's ferry. a different ferry, but they put that on a ferry and they <clears throat> ferry it across. The rest of the train will be changed out now. And so only thing that's going to continue on that uh, was from the original one would be that hearse car. But they, they put him on a ferry. That amazes me. Uh, his son's um, casket never left the funeral car. Right. It stayed in the funeral car the whole time. Yeah, that's a good question. Guarded, by the way. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, in New York... Um, We've got a couple things to say about it besides just that they were ferried across the Hudson. Um, all of the ships in the harbor had to display their flags at half mast. And once it got across the Hudson, uh, it was taken to City Hall. And um, so the, the body uh, was taken to City Hall. And there's actually an interesting photograph that you might want to show at this time. Well, you want to talk about the rest of it? I, I was going to oh, okay. let you show the photograph first. All right. Uh, hello, Michael. Michael Ferro Jr. is here. Hello, hello, hello. So hello. here's a pretty cool photograph. This is from New York. Mm -hmm. And we've slightly doctored it a little. Uh, you'll notice that big red circle probably wasn't in the original, right? Uh, <laughs> that big red circle is uh, showing off one of the windows of a building with some people inside. And you can see down Two below. little boys. You can see down below the procession. Those two little boys are an interesting individual set there. Should um, we ask them if they know who they are? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Do you guys know who those two little boys are? And in case you were curious, the upper right-hand corner there, that is a blown-up version of that window. Who knows who that is? And Michael says hi back. Delay, delay, delay. Delay, delay. Yep, delay, you're delay, right. Delay, delay. <clears throat> no idea. Riser's treasure hunting got it right. Ooh, good job. The youngest little boy to the left happens to be future president Theodore Roosevelt. And that his, that's his older brother, Elliot. That house right there that they're passing by is their grandfather's mansion in New York City. And you'll notice that on, on there, uh, those those windows and the pillars out front, they all have these you know black sashes and things. Pretty much everywhere that they stopped, all the buildings uh, in those towns had that done to them. Uh, that was some of the mourning draperies and things like that. Yes, there was a shortage of black material. Yes, actually when they got to Springfield, they didn't have enough. Yeah. Yeah, so they had to change and they had, instead of just black, they also had white. So in uh, New York City, there was a little interesting thing that happened. Uh, first of all, um, the procession just went on for hours. And again, people waited and waited and waited. And people were turned away, including dignitaries from other countries. They're, yeah, they're like, like, sorry, yeah, sorry we got to load up and get out of here. Yeah. But there was something that interesting that, that took place, um, like a ceremonial. And that's something with Captain Parker Snow. Yeah. Marianne's uh, going to tell you about that. Yeah. 
Um, so Captain Parker Snow, and I can't see because this is, you know, way too dark in here for me to see this, but um, he was actually the commander of the Artie and the Antarctic, which were some of the um, exploring expedition trips at the time. Uh, he presented to General Dix, who was in charge of the funeral train at that point, um, and he wasn't the whole time. He did leave the funeral train and, and pass those duties on to someone else. But at this time... All right, hold on just a second. We had a little glitch. We had a glitch? I hate it when we have glitches. <sighs> okay, I think we're good now. Okay. I hate glitches. Yeah. Especially when I get going and get right. excited. So we were talking about Captain Parker Snow. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he, he visits uh, General Dix and he says, I have a, a little bit of something I want to do. <laughs> And he's like, what do you want to do? Uh, so he uh, wanted some things to be interred with the president. So what did he want interred in the coffin with the president? Well, they were some relics from John Franklin's ill-fated expedition that he had gone and, and uh, with his wife's uh, permission went and looked for. And the things that he had... Uh, that he added to President Lincoln's coffin, with General Dick's permission, uh, were a tattered leaf of a prayer book, which the first word uh, was martyr, a piece of fringe from some portions of a uniform, and these were... Uh, basically buried out of sight like you wouldn't you didn't see them they were in the coffin then after that but they weren't seen by anyone they're kind of tucked away <laughs> but what's really interesting allegedly. is well yeah i guess allegedly but um basically uh it says that these items were found in a boat lying under the head of a human skeleton from this uh, ill-fated expedition of John Franklin's. we got to remember to talk about that Saturday because I wonder if those items are still with him. It we would be interesting. It would be interesting to know that. We'll never know, but. Uh, to know if they actually even checked for that stuff yeah. when said, What's this it was opened up Chucked several it. times. Oops, did I give a spoiler there? Yeah, well, that's Saturday. Okay, yeah. let's okay. get through this. All, All right. right, so that's New York. Yeah. All right, so moving out of New York... <laughs> Um, Irish whiskey says Teddy Roosevelt had a Bigfoot encounter. Yes, mm -hmm. you did. Yep. Uh, moving out of New York, the next major stop was going to be on 425, uh, and it wasn't even a major stop. It was a water stop. Um, they needed some water, so it stopped uh, in the in the town where Sing Sing Prison was. And so it was right right near Sing Sing Prison where they made their stop. They briefly stopped there to take on water. And they let an official from the prison come on board and have some personal time with Lincoln. They were they let him view the body. Uh, so, While they were taking on water. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder if he brought flowers. I don't know. He, he <laughs> Probably should have. Probably not. Probably not. Usually, it, it was always, every time that they mentioned anywhere in any documentation that I found um, where somebody brought flowers, they came onto the train and brought flowers, it was always a, a, a series of women. Okay. All right, so on the 25th also was a short stop just outside of West Point. Um, it was in a place called Garrison's Landing, and uh, it was right across from, uh, from right across from West Point. And so they had a company of regular soldiers and about a thousand of their cadets that came in. They had uh, their their rifles, you know, and everything, and they were full dress and, and everything. They came in. They let every one of them file through the funeral hearse car of the train uh, and, and be with the, uh, the president. So that was kind of interesting. Well, right, as they're uh, paying respects to their former commander-in-chief while yes. guns from West Point were continually fired across the river. They did con they did um, that the whole time they were there and until the train was out of sight. They kept on firing uh, from across the river at West Point. Yeah. Uh, 
When it leaves there, it goes to Albany, New York, and this is going to be one of the major stops, and uh, they're going to offload the president here again. He's going to be taken to another state capitol. And they take by it to procession. The assembly <laughs> chamber, yes, by procession. Um, and at this time, they see that there's such an enormous group again, and they're like, this, this is like bigger, way bigger than we expected. You guys better send some people over there to Springfield and tell them they better they better get ready because this is this is nuts. So they send a delegation ahead of the funeral train to Springfield to make sure that in Springfield they're going to be ready for this because it's just yeah, too many people yeah. and everything. Yeah. So, all right. On the 26th, uh, they they have left uh, Albany and they go to Buffalo, New York. Um, they offload again, uh, and they transport him to St. James Hall. Oh, this is the one with the horses. This one's pretty good. Yeah, cool. they take him to St. James Hall, and they put him uh, in a hearse car uh, on a cavalcade uh, drawn by six white horses that are dressed in black materials. Was it, there's a few no. interesting things about no, these later, one, um, but um, there's 100,000 people that pass by his coffin that day alone, just that day. Um, and mourners that you'll visit here or that visited here were ex-president Millard Fillmore and the future president Grover Cleveland. Um, there was also no fu formal funeral procession here in Buffalo. They had planned one, uh, but they didn't really have one that they had for the train itself. They had a procession and a funeral previous. They had it on the 19th because there was this decree that all cities should have something on the 19th when you know they were having the funeral you know in Washington. Um, so they didn't really plan on a formal processional. However, a bunch of the townspeople just made one anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of had one. It just wasn't a, a major planned one. On the 28th, they moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And this is the one where we actually participated in the reenactment uh, back in 2015. Last week's, last Saturday's live stream, we talked about that and showed the pictures. Yeah. So um, uh, they arrive in Cleveland at 7 o'clock in the morning at the Euclid Street Station. The coffin is removed from the train. It is transported by Hearst to Cleveland's public park, and they're placed uh, in a pagoda building that they basically built outdoors uh, in Monument Square. Uh, it is the only town where the public viewing was done in an outdoor facility. It was not in the <coughs> side of a major building or anything like that. Yeah, in the Cleveland, whole time during this train funeral train it poured down rain yes and it was so raining. this was outside pouring down rain and it was raining in cleveland that day the whole time as well so he's outside it's raining yeah. he's um, under a pagoda he's under a pagoda still. yeah uh so they're there uh and about uh 15 hours they are there and 150,000 people are able to pass by the coffin. They said that so many people were able to pass by it because it was more of an outdoor thing. They didn't have to like get into a building and go around in the building. They were able to just file past, so it went a little quicker. They also suggested that Cleveland did a really good job of preparing for uh, the funeral train to, to arrive. And they attributed that to the fact that uh, pretty much immediately after finding out on the 19th that they were going to have uh, one of these be one of these stops, they made a committee and they said, you guys are in charge of figuring this out. The 20th, they made a second committee. And then so these two committees actually worked together and made it all pretty much go without a hitch. Okay, so we're not paying attention to our chat. We're not being very good host here but anyways let's see tanya lambert says mind-boggling uh phil cochran stopped by hello hello hello, hello. uh Teresa gregory i have to go i have enjoyed the talk so far uh i will watch again later that's okay you have a great evening yes it will be out there for eternity now right yeah hopefully <laughs> uh lori bryant okay i'm still here had to do my paranormal cardio with k oh awesome. paranormal nice. cardio i like that yeah 
Um, Brendan Berger okay. said that the prison official probably didn't have any flowers. Uh, they probably weren't handy being in a prison. Probably true. <laughs> All right. Okay, the pilot train. Yeah, so in Cleveland, uh, the pilot train or that scout train, uh, the name of the one that they used was the Louisville. And the actual engine of the funeral train, the one that was pulling the hearse car and the other car, the other <coughs> nine cars of the train, uh, was called the Nashville. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody this asked is a question important. about this. Yeah, somebody had asked if oh, the, if it was the same, if it was the same, same railroad, train. same train. Okay. This train, uh, actually, we have a question about this. So we're, I'm just going to let you yeah. ask, ask so that question. So here's a picture first. of the Nashville. Yeah. Okay. So when most people think of Lincoln's funeral train, that's the tr that's the engine that they see because it has that picture of Lincoln on the front and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, all decorated up. And yeah, and all that stuff. So the question I that we have is, there we go. Where are you gonna, well, you got to push it over. Let them see it. I'm going to. Okay, well, you said there you go. There you go. <laughs> Why is the Nashville the most famous engine used for the funeral train? Does anybody know? Yeah, does anybody know why we know <coughs> this one? Because this is not the only funeral engine, funeral train engine that we had through this. You know, we said that they were switching them out. Why is this one the one that everybody knows? Anybody here know? Happy Trail says your peeper frogs oh, are very loud. Are you gonna make loud. me shut the window? Oh, I'm gonna get Thank you, Kate. Hot. They're still loud. <laughs> Philip Cochran says that he loves Lincoln history. He's going to have to check up on this a little bit later. Thanks for stopping in. Um, well, we could tell him the answer because that's kind of a answer? hard one. All right, so here's what happened. Okay, when the papers came out covering the funeral train, they used that picture, okay? Lincoln Funeral Train, the Lincoln Funeral Train. So for years, years, people thought that that was the same engine. That was used the whole route. That was used the whole time. So that's why the Nashville, which is the train was that was used to go from Cleveland to, to Columbus, Columbus, right, um, is the most famous. Yes, but it's not the only train engine that was used. Right. It actually had an inscription that said the Nashville, the engine that pulled the well, the Lincoln Special, uh, and, you know, it wasn't the only one. But because of that statement, everybody thought for years it was the only one. Yeah. yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, on the 29th. Uh, after uh, the funeral train left Cleveland and went to a couple little towns in between, uh, they end up in Columbus for their next offloading. Uh, it's going to go to the state capitol there, uh, here in Ohio, I should say. Not necessarily there, it's still Ohio. Um, I believe this is a picture in Columbus. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so here's a picture of the procession. Basically. Brendan Berger says, don't shut the window. They add to this information. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm probably about 10 minutes, and I'm going to open it back up again because I'm already starting to get warm. And I can still hear them in here. I'm sure that you guys yeah, can, You guys too. are probably still here. They're very loud. I need to get some dynamite or something to chuck out the window <laughs> before we go live. Gilbert says, oh, the sounds of nature. <laughs> if you guys were with us last year, we, we talked about that. Our neighbors put in a pond and it just attracts frogs that's all it does yeah <laughs> so anyways this is uh uh cleveland and that's basically I what it looks like columbus. no columbus yeah, yeah. so this is basically you know look at the ornate stuff the city you know every city made their own every city version. made their own version and all that stuff it's just yeah amazing yeah the time and effort they put into mm -hmm. all this okay here we go all so right. our numbers are off but that's okay. That's okay. So we're going to head out then now <coughs> to Indianapolis, Indiana. We're going to finally get into Indiana. Um, this is going to be on the 30th of April. Uh, we're So we're getting quite a far into this like trip. 
he's not quite, you know. Yeah, he's not doing too good. crisp and chipper looking anymore. Uh, but he is carried to the Indiana State House, and um, he's placed into a hearse that is topped by a silver gilt eagle and everything, and it's it's very ornate. Um, the train from uh, last stop to Indianapolis, they had other little towns in between, and one of those trip stops in between was Richmond, uh, where he would be viewed by Vice President Thomas Hendricks. Um, he ended up, uh, I mean, it was just one of those drive-by ones. It wasn't one where they had... Wait, let me have a glitch again. Something popped up over there. It says it's good. Oh, it got blurry. Oh. Well, you know it's always blurry for me. Okay. Oh. Uh, Lady Vam says, no, they're nature. And Happy Trail says, no, dynamite. They're, they're saying to be nice to our, our little organisms living and uh, making uh, all that noise outside. Yeah, he wouldn't do that. i go to sleep to that. Yeah. No, I wouldn't do that, maybe. He jokes about it, but he would never. No, I wouldn't do yeah. that. He doesn't even have access to such things. <laughs> but anyways, let's get uh, continuing on. Um, uh, in Indianapolis, I was saying he was being... Uh, taken uh, by this hearse that had a silver gilt eagle at the top. Um, but six of the eight horses that were pulling this coffin were actually horses that pulled the carriage that Lincoln was in when he was on his way to Washington four years earlier when he kind of rode by um, and through that through Indianapolis. So they felt it was important to use those horses again. Um, so everything, you find this in several different other towns too, different trains that were used, the same engine was used, and the same people that were um, the engineers and things like that. So um, this is one of those places where the horses that were used were actually horses that met Lincoln in life and then pulled him in death as well. So that's kind of interesting. Um, now, uh, in this particular area, there were a couple things that were kind of sad. Uh, one, again, it rained again. Uh, it was so heavy in Indianapolis that the giant procession that they had planned, it got canceled, and they just in, you know, devoted the entire day to viewing. Now, that didn't necessarily cancel the whole thing because people clearly still participated in it. It just was not as ornate as they planned because it was such torrential rains. Um, but also because of this rain, the governor, uh, Morton, he failed to give his oration that he was going to give as well. So that's kind of interesting. Like, I would have still given it. I don't care if it's raining, it's the president, but whatever. Um, all the streetcars in Indianapolis were going to have uh, slogans on them, uh, and some of the ones that, that were reported were um, streetcar number 10. They had a sign on it that said, sorrow for the dead, justice for the living, and punishment for traitors. Uh, car number 13 said, fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, thy reward shall be exceedingly great. Uh, and car number 20 uh, said, thou art gone, and friend and foe alike appreciate thee now. Which is interesting because in the newspapers um, where they're talking about um, the funeral train coming tomorrow and different things like that, whatever, um, there's an article about five soldiers who were hung by their comrades until they were almost dead because they were caught rejoicing over the death of the president. So, you know, we had these two cities, you know, Cincinnati yeah. and, and what they, they weren't allowed to have a stop because they were worried about the Confederate sympathizers here. Their people took care of it themselves, really. And but that it, I mean, they went so far as to say, you can't you can't do that. And they hung these people, but they didn't hang them to death. They did no. end up surviving. But they just kind of punished them a little bit crazy um, that they would be thinking about doing that you know but to each his own I guess all right um next store 
<laughs> Next uh, stop uh, would be on May 1st, May Day, and that is Michigan City. It's a very short stop, but at this time, short... Uh, Schoiler Colfax, who was one of the people who was invited to go to the play with him at the theater that fateful night, uh, were uh, was actually there. He ends up being Grant's vice president, and he uh, gets to view uh, with um, the president's body. Um, he they also um, had just stopped for breakfast there, um, and they had an impromptu small funeral. Also, on the 1st, we arrive in Chicago. Um, the train arrives in Chicago at 11 a.m. And um, it didn't even go necessarily the, to the place that it had intended to. It stopped on a trestle bridge um, that carried the tracks out <laughs> to Lake Michigan for a while. Um, and then the Chicago procession for Mr. Lincoln uh, was considered to rival New York's size in grandeur. Um, but the route went down Michigan Avenue, then it was on Lake Street, Clark, and, and eventually ends up in Courthouse Square, where 37,000 people are part of the procession. Can you imagine I forgot a to put procession that Chicago picture in here. with 37,000 people in it? That to me is just like amazing. Yeah, that's the procession. That's the procession, and that's also the reason for the length of time between when Lincoln's body gets there and when it first gets viewed. Remember, they got there at 11 a.m., but there's 37,000 people in the in the uh, the procession, so it doesn't turn out that until 5 o'clock in the evening that the procession is over and the embalmers get to open up the casket and work on it and make him look good Present again presentable, presentable. Yeah. and then well, something that, else that's interesting yeah, about that, that 37,000 yeah is that one of the uh say it groups, right. one of the groups that was involved in the procession was a full regiment of infantry thank you you're welcome <laughs> of the confederate states of america's army they ended up taking an oath to the United States and were allowed to be part of the procession because they all took that oath. Yeah, they swore their allegiance back to the United yeah. States. The entire and I think regiment. That's amazing <clears throat> that they, you know, they canceled two cities because they were worried about Confederate sympathizers. And here they have Confederate Army <laughs> being part of one of the ceremonies. So that's really cool. Um, so they eventually open up the coffin uh, for viewing at Cook County Courthouse um, at 6 p.m. And it lasts all the rest of that night and the next day as well. It kept well. going all night long and all the next day yes. in Chicago. Yeah. So Gilbert Rod says, 37,000 people. Imagine a baseball stadium crowd on the street. That's, That's crazy. That's a good That's a analogy. good analogy. Yes. That's about the same that we're marching down that street yeah. for six hours, right? Roughly? 11 to 5? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, so it's it, it's just amazing. Um, so in any case, they did suggest that like uh, 150,000 people saw his body on the second day, and the first day it was 75,000 people, including the 37,000 that were originally part of the procession. It was just huge. Are you done with that? It was absolutely huge. Yes, I okay. am done with that. So okay. This is the next one. All right, so... How are we doing? On. Do we need to stretch? <laughs> I'm adjusting my catheter. <laughs> You're so funny. All right. So uh, the funeral train then uh, leaves there and goes through a couple small cities again along the way. And on the 3rd of May, it finally arrives at Springfield. <sighs> And the coffin's taken off, taken to the state house, where again they have public viewing uh, and uh, all kinds of ornate decorations and everything. And Sean says, "That's where we're going to stop with the funeral train and the funeral, and we're going to pick up what took place in Springfield Saturday's live stream." Yeah, because officially, technically, the funeral train is now done. Yes. 
All right. So what do you guys think? Did you find any new information in any of that so far? Because we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We've got to talk about the funeral car, then we've got to talk about the ghost car. Then we'll be done. The ghost train. Or the ghost train. Yes. So who, who learned something new today? <laughs> throw that out there. Why don't you show them a picture of uh, the All right, the so here's car the funeral car. Answers. Happy Trail says, I already got my stretching done. <laughs> this is the funeral car. The name of this car was called the United States. Yes. <coughs> it was a custom presidential built That's train. Right. So think about it like this, okay? That train car would be equivalent to what we know as Air Force One today. That's right. Okay. They started building this car in 1863, and it was supposed to be the presidential car. All right. Like, so like I said, somewhat like Air Force One today. Yeah. Want to uh, go ahead over um, real quick to the picture. I just want to point something out to them. Um, if you notice, uh, there are four sets of wheels, <laughs> sort of the rail wheels on yes. there. Traditionally, it would only have two sets uh, or eight wheels. This would have 16 because of the, it being the president's car. They wanted it to be more smooth of a ride and for him and all of his more personnel. More comfortable. More comfortable. And so they added these two extra wheel sets on there. And so they had a total of 16 wheels on there instead. And it turned out kind of, I guess, would work out for carrying his body across all yeah. those places yeah. as well. So, but here's the thing about the car. Lincoln was kind of like, he, he like approved it, but he didn't really want to talk about it or anything like that because he thought it was f a frivolous expense while the, the war was going on. Yeah, he's like, I don't want people to look at it funny, you know. Like, we, we're spent, we need to spend the money on the war and, and really yeah. take care of of our national security basically so he actually never saw the car right okay it was completed in 19 or 1865 just days before ford's theater yeah okay and actually he was scheduled to well legend has it legend he was scheduled it. to right. go and see this car on april 15th but he got the shot that, the day that on he died. the 14th, and he died at 7.22 a.m. on the 15th, so he never did get to go see that. Construction on this began in 1863. Um, I said that. I, I didn't notice if you did or not. I, I wanted to make that. sure that you did, did say, say it. That. Okay. All right. I did say that. Okay. All right. So, what happened to the car after the funeral? Yeah. Somebody asked that earlier in the chat. They said, hey, so where I'm is it now? So, I'm going to show them the... the uh, I'm going to show them the graphics on this one. Okay. And while you do that, uh, we did have some people say so much new stuff. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, it's all fascinating and new. I know I did. Uh, so much information. I definitely did. So people did learn some new things tonight. All right. Well, cool. So that's kind of cool. All right. So after the funeral train, it was never used again by the federal government. Yeah. Okay. One year after the burial, the car was sold to the Union Pacific Railroad for $6,800. Mm -hmm. Now, think about it. I mean, this is 1863. That's not a cheap sum. You know, that was a, a pretty decent uh, pay there. Um, but $6,800. Gilbert, hold on. We're going to tell you where it's at today. Okay? Yeah. Um, it became the personal car of railroad builder Thomas C. Durant. And that's his picture right there. That's Thomas C. Durant, okay? Mm -hmm. In 1874, Durant loses much of his wealth and sells the car to the Colorado Central Railroad for $3,000. Yeah. He kind of lost on that deal because he had paid yeah. so much more He needed the, He that. needed the cash. Yeah. All right, so the car was stripped of all of its elaborate decorations and ornamentation and was put into service as part of a regular passenger service car. Can you believe that? Amazing. The extra wheels were removed and placed back to the steer standard carriage type. So those extra wheels that Marianne was talking about, they took them off and made it like a standard car. Yeah, so all of the normal uh, way of a normal passenger car is what it was stripped down to. And that's just so sad because this was literally, you know, I mean, 
This was the car that transferred the yeah. body of Lincoln everywhere. In 1898, the car gets sold again to Union Pacific, the former owner, and they made an effort to restore the car but failed. They did put it on display at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. K, you should have been there. <laughs> yeah. In 1905, the car gets sold to Thomas Lowry of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that is unfortunate. Yes. So, then the car is put into use for special events and marked occupation <clears throat> no, that's not right. Such as transporting William McKinley around Minneapolis. Yes. Uh, it was intended to uh, be toured as the last remaining... Rem oh, we just went off on it again, I think. We're back. Okay. We're back. It was intended to be toured as the last remaining remnant of the Lincoln funeral train, but that did not happen because on March 18, 1911... A rampaging fire destroys the shed that held the Lincoln funeral car, and the car was destroyed. Yeah. You, I think you have a, I uh, have a picture. picture of the newspaper article for this. Yes. Uh, they were actually intending to, uh, you know, make this, you know, a, an important relic, uh, but there was a big fire in the town, and it took out a, a ton of buildings and, and things like that, and one of them just happened to be this one that held the Lincoln train. <coughs> Souvenir hunters gathered the remains that they could with permission. They had permission to do that. Yeah, the okay. owner said, yeah, go ahead, take what you want. Uh, some of the items are housed in the Western Heritage Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. Yes. So what does or what happened to the train car before it was completely destroyed? What did it look like? There you go. Right there. That's kind of sad. Yeah. Very sad. Um, so there you can go to that museum in Omaha, Nebraska, and you can take a look at some of the pieces that they have. They have some of the um, car uh, seating and things like that, um, some wood pieces. And for those of you who have been hearing the last couple of years about the uh, replica of the Lincoln funeral train car. Yeah, there, there, there is a group that got together and um, they made a replica of the car. And the engine. And the uh, Nashville engine. And um, during the 150th, it did uh, it stopped some touring. It stopped places. at a couple of the and places. And it's touring right now. Is it? Mm -hmm. Where's it at? Uh, I don't know where it's at right this second, oh, but so I would love a to few days back, if you remember, yeah. um, they posted a new video of where it was. Yeah. We were supposed to go <clears> there, but we didn't. I don't have a link to the video. I should have had that for you guys, but if you... Oh, I know why we don't have it, because we watched it on our TV, TV. the other night. Mm -hmm. um, if you look on YouTube, um, there, <coughs> there's some drone footage of them offloading it onto the tracks. It's actually pretty cool yeah. uh, of the train. Yeah. But. But the reason I was mentioning that was some of these pieces um, that were taken at this time in 1911 were passed down through generations to different family members. And one of them was uh, used to determine the actual train car color. So they took paint chips from uh, a piece of the windowsill from one of these pieces of the train car from back then. And... Um, they did a chemical analysis of it and figured out the exact color of the train. And that's the reason that the train car that they have now as the replica is painted the way it is, yes. which is very cool. Yes. So this next part, we're going to talk about the ghost train that appears. The ghost train? <clears throat> the paranormal part? I was actually going to have Boris do this, but my voice is gone. My throat is like raw. It's just, there's no way. Hello, my friends. No, nope, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <clears throat> no. Okay. So, the reason why we're doing this, I'm in April. Well, I'm at, we're into May now. But, anyways, well, the ghost train appearance happens in the springtime, the same time the train took the path. So, that was, what is it? April 21st to May 3rd. April 21st to May 3rd. I'll forget that 400 times. <laughs> but 
along the path. I mean, it happens all along the path. And here are some of the claims, some of the claims. All right, you guys ready? You guys ready to hear this? I did it again. <coughs> I don't want to do that. I don't know what I do. So if these pieces are available, do you suppose they hold any paranormal activity? What do you think? I have my opinion. I have my opinion as well. Uh, That's a good question. You know, yes and no. I mean, it. there were a ton of people who traveled along with this, a ton of people who visited it. You know, the, the ghost of Lincoln is found in so many places that why not, right? Plus there is the ghost train of, of the Lincoln train, uh, the Lincoln special that comes through uh, some of these towns. Why not? Yeah. Uh, if you caught our last ghost stories and folklore about Ford's Theater, uh, one of the things that was mentioned in there is the, the sudden shift of emotions for the entire nation. I mean, think about this. At that time, the generally surrendered. The war is coming to an end. You know, it's basically over because the major Confederates, I mean, it, it was over. Everyone's celebrating. All this is happening. And then three days later, boom, the entire nation in mourning. That shift of happiness and rejoice to sadness. And I did mention, in, or Boris mentioned in the Ghost Stories of Folklore, some people never laughed again because this affected so many people in a traumatic way that they were just mel melancholy for the rest of their lives. So think about that shift in emotion that took place. It's no wonder that this train just doesn't show up every once in a while. Yeah. All right, so you guys ready? We'll go over these claims. Is everyone still with us? How many people we still have? Yeah. Wow, still, still got still 18 going. hanging yep. with us. All mm -hmm. right. All right, so let's go over this, and we'll uh, got some more questions for you, and we'll wrap it up because yeah, this we're is the already part almost that, two hours. This is the part that the, the paranormal <coughs> people will really like. Yeah, all right, so the uh, ghost train appears in the spring around the same time the funeral train takes place. I said that. Mm -hmm. um, it's seen along the entire path, also known as Lincoln's Phantom Train. The train never reaches Springfield. Now, there's a conspiracy theory about that, that Lincoln actually never did reach Springfield. That they took him off and they hid him in some yeah, other they hid him. undisclosed location. And we're going to talk about this on Saturday, too, about the funeral, about how many times he was moved in the grave robbers and all that stuff like that. But, but for this, I, I don't really believe that. Because he was open for viewing in Springfield, <coughs> and people in Springfield knew him. Yeah. If they walked up to him, they're like, that's not him. Yeah. <laughs> that would have, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, the most experiences that, that they have, and this kind of makes sense, okay, because of the volume of people, okay. Uh, Albany, New York, uh, between 426, 427. Uh, Urbany, Ohio, uh, 429. And Chicago on May Day. Right. Um, Those are the one. dates that they are still tend to see them, uh, the funeral train, show up again on its journey. Yeah. So these are the experiences. The air on the tracks becomes cool and sharp. Clouds cover the moon. A ghostly headlight pierces through the night, coming from an unmanned train engine dubbed the Nashville. That would be Urbania. Mm -hmm. There is a thick black fog. The air becomes noticeably heavier and colder. There is a rush of wind, and the train passes by with no noise. The train has dark garland cars. Uh, some reports the train has no sounds. Other report hearing mournful music coming from the cars. Uh, some see smoke coming from a stack, and sometimes the stack is invisible. Some people hear an eerie whistle as the train approaches, and it sounds quite different from modern train horns. There are reports of skeleton honor guards dressed in blue that stand at attention by Lincoln's, Lincoln's flagged drape coffin. That one's interesting. Um, flags and streamers attached to the train whip in the wind, but make no sound as the train disappears from view. 
Train crossing signals will drop mysteriously where there's nothing on the tracks. Yes. That could be a malfunction, but... It could be. Um, there are more. Go ahead. You want to finish? Yeah. The phantom yeah. train sometimes will encounter a real, honest to goodness, their train. Like, it's really there. And if that happens, all the sounds suddenly hush as the <laughs> phantom train... <laughs> Uh, goes right through the regular train. Uh, sometimes it's spotted in areas where there were tracks at one time, but the tracks have been removed, the line doesn't go through there anymore, uh, but the funeral train still does. Uh, people, uh, including railway workers, report that their watches and clocks, things like this, stop when the ghost train passes through, and then for the rest of the day, all of the trains that run along that same track they're five to eight minutes behind the rest of the day. And it kind of makes sense if they stopped all traffic of public anything as this train went through, mm -hmm. right? Um, so everybody else would be delayed. Um, there are other reports that there's a, a vast number of blue-coated men that follow the train with coffins on their backs as if the vast armies of men who died during the war are escort escorting the phantom train of the president yet today. That one would be creepy. That, that would be very creepy. Yeah. All right, so um, there was a question. Why hide him? Well, okay, so the end of the war, okay, and Booth was a Southern sympathizer. There were people that were trying to take Abraham Lincoln's body back to the South. They did not want the Confederacy to surrender. They did not want to lose the war. Okay, so that's why they're yeah. They there thought were those they'd issues. get a, they thought they'd get ahead if they stole his body. Yeah, they stole his body, and we you know we're still victorious and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. So originally we were going to read some of these. Um, yeah, we have a personal... Personal accounts. I have a couple personal accounts. A couple but... personal accounts that... Go ahead. You can read them. Do you okay. want Marianne to read these, or you guys you guys want a little bit more, or we can wrap it up and I can ask your questions. Let's, let's ask them. Uh, Lady Vamp <coughs> says, I would like to see that and get a picture of it. <clears throat> I would, too. And someday, Sean and I have talked about this, we're going to actually go uh, and follow. We want to drive that path. There are markers along the way. Um, markers of Lincoln's funeral train that you can go to. That would be cool mm -hmm. to have them pictures. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Markers. Yeah. So someday we're going to go do that, and uh, we might just have to wait until, you know, we retire so that we can be off of school during the Lincoln train time. But uh, we are, someday I'm going to do that. I would love to be able to see the <clears throat> Phantom Train. All right. Ghost Rapids, Ghost Hunter says, read them. Happy Trail says, please. And Riser's Treasure Hunting says, selfishly, keep going. All right. So okay. I will do that. Right. So All right. these are personal accounts. Um, personal reports of people who've Who's, actually experienced this. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, Do you it need was. More light? Uh, I, I'm. I'm gonna kind of go like this and then I'll try yellow. to see it. Oh, no, wait, it's no, okay. Here, look, it's all right. You're gonna bring me some some I'll bring you fun, more fun light. light. Oh, nice. All right. Ready? Yeah. Blind you. That's good. All right. Okay. Uh, it was late at night and very dark. I was stopped in my car near my hometown's depot. Being late, the area was deserted except for two railroad employees who stood on the train platform smoking and talking. I was about to cross the tracks when the crossing guards dropped down. I then heard an odd train whistle. Within moments, I saw an old-fashioned steam engine puffing smoke with its flared funnel. It was pulling several antique cars, all dressed in black crepe. As it came closer, I noticed it moved in complete silence. A strange blue glow surrounded the train as it slowed and stopped at the depot platform. The whistle blew once more. One train that stopped directly in front of me was decked out even more ornately. I saw through its large windows a coffin. It drawed on me, it dawned on me that this must be a funeral coach. An honor guard of soldiers watched over the casket inside. When I looked closer, I was taken aback, for these soldiers appeared to be skeletons. To the side of this car, a band of soldiers played slowly 
what I assumed to be a dirge. They too were skeletons dressed in midnight blue uniforms. I realized I heard no music. I glanced over at the two employees at the platform and I noticed they didn't comprehend any better than I what we were seeing for they stood very still as if in a trance. I heard the train whistle once more and the train moved on and disappeared into the dark night traveling westward. My legs were shaking. I got out of my car and walked to where the other two men stood. When I questioned them, they told me that no one was scheduled to travel through that town that night. They seemed to be in shock and were having trouble focusing. Later, I heard that all of the clocks in town had stopped exactly 20 minutes, the length of time that the strange train had stayed at the depot. Afterwards, I realized that what I saw that night was Lincoln's phantom train. Over the years, I've heard many stories about sightings of this train in New York, Ohio, and Indiana, but felt they were just fantasy or folklore before. So that was one of the experiences, and I do have another. That would have been so creepy, says Happy Trails. I agree, but so cool at the same oh, time. That would have been awesome. I mean, to see that and then to look at the You're skeletons, right, it, Boris it, would be like, you know. It would have been a creepy experience, but then afterwards would have been like, whoa. <sighs> I can't believe I just experienced that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. All right, so this one uh, is an experience of an actual worker for a railroad. Robin, Robin Pauly, hello, and I'm sorry you walked in on me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right, so we just dropped off again. We did. Oh, stream status bad. See, it isn't so. Might be okay. All right. All right, so um, are you ready for me to go again, or you want to I wait a minute? I want to see if minute? that freezes a second. Okay. Lady Vamp says, oh, OMG, to experience that would be so amazing. It would be. It would be, you're right, just mind phenomenal. Blown. I might, I don't know, I wouldn't. I was going to say, I might have to end my <laughs> investigation. Happy Trail for, says, whoa, I can't believe I forgot to film it. <laughs> yeah. Where's the camera? He left it in the car. Yeah. 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 Oh. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go ahead and Okay, go this. ahead. All right, so this one says, I'd been transferred to the Hudson Division of the New York Central System and was working on the rails on the main line between New York and Albany. I was on the late shift to start with since I was a bit of a night owl. After six weeks of stomping the tracks and mending the rails, I was feeling right at home in my new job. Then, just before midnight on a clear spring night in late April, we got a report of some brush on a track near our station. I was sent out to immediately clear it away before the next train came. I had nearly an hour before the next train was scheduled, so I didn't hurry as I was walking along the rails. It was surprisingly pleasant and rather warm weather. Overhead, the clouds were obscuring the moon, but the light from my lantern made a cheerful glow in the night. Suddenly, a chilly wind swept over the rails with a whoosh like the wind just before a thunderstorm. It was so strong that it nearly knocked me over. I staggered backward, swearing and windmilling my arms to try to keep my balance. I almost dropped the lantern, but managed to get my balance just before it slipped out of my hand. Shivering in the sudden cold, I squinted down, I squinted, uh, down the track and saw a huge blanket of utter darkness rolling toward me. It blanked out the rails, the trees, the sky, everything. Good Lord, what is that? I gasped. I leapt away from the track and started to run back toward the station, but the darkness swept up over me before I had moved a yard. The lantern in my hand was snuffed out instantly. I stopped, unable to see more than a few paces around me. To my right, the rails began to gleam with a strange blue light. I staggered backward from the tracks, my pulses pounding in fear and dread. What was going on? Then the headlight of a train pierced the thick darkness. It gleamed blue-white in the strange black fog, and then it appeared. The rails brightened in response. A huge steam engine 
draped in black crepe approached, stacks blowing forth a steady stream of smoke. The brass on the engine gleamed, and it pulled several flat cars behind it. I stared into the windows of the engine, but couldn't see any crew. Just at the edge of hearing came a faint sound of music, and turned to look at the flat cars behind the engine. I gasped and backed up so far that I bumped into the trunk of a tree growing near the tracks. There was a glowing orchestra of skeletons seated in a semicircle. They were playing a nearly soundless funeral dirge on glowing black instruments. A violinist played passionately. A skeleton lifted a flute to its lipless mouth. A lone drummer sat waiting patiently for his cue from the skeletal conductor. Then the orchestra was gone, and another glowing headlight pierced the blackness. I was trying unsuccessfully to push my way through the bark of the tree by this time. Another black crepe-draped train was approaching. A funeral train, I thought. Again, there was no one manning the engine, and no one appeared on the flat car behind it. The only thing was there was a single black crepe-draped coffin but swirling in the air around the train were ghostly figures of soldiers dressed in blue uniforms worn by the North during the Civil War. They lined up before my eyes, saluting the solitary coffin as it passed. Some of the ghosts staggered under the weight of their own coffins. Some limped on one leg or sat in a wheeled chair, legless. Their eyes were fixed upon the flat car and the black craped coffin. Then they were joined by soldiers from the Southern Army, and all of these lads saluted too, honoring the one who had fallen. That's when I knew what I had been seeing. It was the funeral train of Abraham Lincoln. I straightened up and saluted myself, having done my bit for the North many years ago. The, stream, the steam train moved slowly away, and with it went the darkness and the chill and the clouds that had obscured the moon. In my hand the lantern sprang back to life. I blinked a few times and brushed away a tear. As the world around me brightened, I saw a reported brush. I saw the reported brush littering the tracks right in front of me. Mechanically, I cleared it away and made sure the track was safe for the next train. Then I went back to the station. The next morning, all of the clocks on the Hudson division were six minutes behind and all of the trains were running six minutes late. When I asked the station master about this, he shook his head and told me not to worry. It was caused by the Lincoln death train, which had stopped time after time as it had, as it ran through the night. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah. So, um, Ron and Polly, good night. Um, good night. It was nice to have you, and that's actually my last story. All right, so we got some questions for you guys. Two. Two questions. Two questions? Two, well, we asked questions throughout the presentation. Yes, so. but two more questions. All right, two so question questions. number one. Why do you think the ghost train still is still seen today? Why do you think the ghost train is still seen today? So, so when did we cover this on, uh, we covered this on the, yeah, radio? Uh, two, <clears throat> two years ago? Two years ago. So those, it was just after we did the Lincoln train. So those claims that she read, uh, we... Three years ago, maybe. We probably found them a couple years ago, so it's been, you know, fairly recent. Fairly recent. We didn't have to go research those again, because we had a lot of that stuff from when we did the radio the sure. radio spot, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, now, you did mention that you saw that recently the number of sightings has gone <coughs> down in the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that interesting because we just did those reenactments back in 2015. So did that kind of give it closure, you know, stirred it up then and then gave it some closure maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, so fairly recently. Fairly recently. Uh, because it's legacy. Energy. <coughs> uh, Energy. Mm -hmm. uh, because so many are attached to it. 
So many have a connection with Lincoln, and we still reenact the Civil War battles. Emotional gravity of the event may have uh, something to do with it. It affected so many. Yeah, because residual hauntings because the land and still holds the energy. I think all. The the, I think all. Gone. Everything that you're yeah. saying is is all spot viable. on. Yeah. All viable. You know, just all that emotions that took place, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's the same. It happens at the same time. You know. Some residual hauntings can happen at any time. It doesn't matter. You know, like the, the residual hauntings at Fort Steer happen at any time. It's not specifically on that anniversary date. But that train, it just moves so slow and all the mourners and everything, you know, mm -hmm. it's at that time, which is, that's, that's an interesting residual yeah. haunting. The, the, that, it's that, it just knows, that, that it knows, hey, I need to be here on the 1st. I yeah. need to be here on the 29th. All right, so the second question, do you think the funeral car should have been sold by the government? Do you think the federal government should have sold that car, or should they have kept it? You know, like Gilbert was saying, that should have been taken to a museum or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know the year that the Smithsonian was established. It was I probably don't. way after that, but that would have been awesome to go yeah. see that in the Smithsonian. But... Uh, why they sold it, I have no idea. They didn't find Even it the car that JFK it. was assassinated in stayed in service. Right. Yeah. Why they sold it, I, I don't know why they sold it. Uh, so Smithsonian was founded uh, 1846. So the Smithsonian was established. Why didn't yeah. it go to the Smithsonian? August 10th, 1846. That's, that's a weird one. I don't think it should have been sold either. I mean, this was this was federal property. We owned this, you know. I I didn't have the time, but you know that's on my list of researching as to figure out why they sold that because right. there's there's got to be a reason. But still, yeah, I don't think it should have been sold. Yeah. That should have been in the Smithsonian. Yeah, um, I like Marty's crew here. <coughs> said um, just like a train sticking to the schedule. I, and and that's true. The trains they they were scheduled, and this is the way it's gonna. And and especially this train, they they planned when this train was gonna be in each of these towns, and they made sure that they didn't care if there were more people there to view the body. We've got to get to that next town. We're closing up. We're out of here. Sorry, dignitary from France. You know, <laughs> you were too late. <laughs> you know, so keeping that schedule, I I, I like that answer. Go. Yeah. I like yeah. that answer a lot. Um, Happy Trails. I think it was a tragedy that it was sold, but the country was in devastated economy after the war. That's true. They could have sold it because they may have needed the money for reconstruction. That's 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 good possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but you would think that if they had planned on having a, you know, Air Force One type train for the president, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hello, they spent the next big president bucks making that. The next president, why would they they, they not get it? You know, uh, they kind of did that with the the cars. Um, they passed those on from one president to the next, and you know, why did they decide not to do that with the Lincoln train? I don't know. Yeah. Unless because it had such a, you know, a stigma of being the funeral train, but then at that time, hello, it's the funeral train. Why are you getting rid of it? Let's keep it. Posterity, folks. Well, that is the end of our presentation. We only ask for one more thing of you guys. First of all, we want to thank everybody for coming and hanging Absolutely. with us. All the super, the super chats that we got. Yeah. We appreciate you guys so much. We love doing these. This is, this is so much fun for us. Uh, just taking what we like to do, because we would have done this anyways, but then being able to put it out for you guys. Uh, this is what we do, you know. <laughs> we just sit there and then we'll find this little piece and oh no, no, look at this. And this is this yeah. the resources that yeah. we use. I mean, oh man, there's yeah. I don't well, know how many web pages I remember when and we books first and, when we first did this, uh, when we first started researching this, it was when we were part of the funeral train <coughs> uh, in 2015 when we did the reenactment, and then I was like looking at stuff and I'm like. 
hey, sweetheart, did you know that they that the funeral train is like a ghost train? And we're like, no way. You know? So we started picking that. And then we're, we found, oh, hey, like they have like the whole list of who went where, when, and all that stuff. And, and we put that together. And now... Um, I'm going to show them your book. Oh, I moved my book. This one? Uh, this book that she researched, which is the Lincoln Funeral Train, we picked this book up in Gettysburg at the train station. So if you guys saw the, the video that we did, Lincoln's Path to Gettysburg, in the beginning of that, it showed that train station where he stopped. That's where we bought that book. In the, in the, you know, of course, every place has a gift shop. But uh, very cool book. Yeah. And unfortunately, that author has passed. Yes. Um, yeah. He did get the book done, though, before he passed away. Mm -hmm. So. Very awesome. He, very well documented. Yeah. And, there's a couple and little things that we there's we're a couple not things, sure because the book says something different. Yeah, and there's else, a couple but. things that we know that were left out of the book um, that I thought was interesting. Like, he doesn't mention anything in the book about um, uh, the window with the uh, Roosevelt. Yeah. He doesn't mention that in there at all, and that's one of the most famous things. He doesn't mention anything about um, the photograph of Lincoln in the coffin being taken and, and finding it. And um, I think uh, that's interesting to me that he doesn't have those. But yet he has information about how many women were bringing flowers and um, that it was a lot of times it was four or six, but sometimes it was 36 women. And why was it 36 women? Because there were 36 uh, states, obviously, in the um, the Union at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, so they you know, would bring one for every every state. A lot of things had 30, some, 36 stars on it and things like that. But um, he has a lot of that kind of information in there. But there's certain things that I was like, wow, I can't believe he didn't have this. But I guess nobody can have everything. Okay. Do you have anything else? Because we've kept these people for two hours and 21 minutes. They love it. You're though. so excited. Okay, but anyway, Saturday's live stream, we're just going to go an hour. But we're going to talk about once they got to Springfield, all the events that took place. And wow, um, that is how we started our haunted travels on our uh, channel was yeah. that trip there. And those videos that we covered. So some of them are a little bit, you know, eh. But uh, we're going to show you some of them. A pictures little? Again. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, the information uh, is cool, but uh, you told me that I could. Okay, whatever. I didn't you mean to open me, up a wound again. You told me that you were going to put stuff over me and so that I yeah. could just read to you. And so literally I was just uh, reading. Yeah, okay. It looks stupid, but that's okay. I that's love right. you anyway. Um. So Saturday we're going to cover the actual funeral in uh, Springfield. And, um, yeah, we're going to continue on next week uh, with a little bit more of the Lincoln stuff. We're going to do the ghost uh, ghost stories of folklore about the uh, Lincoln, um, where all he's been seen. And then you got a recipe coming up, right? Yes, I do. Thursday you're going to have a recipe come out. Yeah, I'm going to do um, Mary Todd Lincoln's vanilla almond cake which was one of lincoln's favorite desserts i'm looking forward to that <laughs> we'll see if you like what lincoln did and then friday we're going to cover the peterson's house and it's that following saturday we're on the road on the road again copyright yes. copyright copyright we will be out going to a new location so risers treasure hunting in Portland says what time saturday we go live Every Saturday, Thursday, it's rare that we go live, but every Saturday, 5 p.m. Eastern, no matter where we're at. So if we're at home, we're in the studio. If we're out and about on a Saturday, which we're traveling season's coming up, we're going to go live from where we're at. So this coming Saturday, we're going to be here. The following Saturday, we're going to be at the Toledo Yacht Club. That's right. For a paranormal conference, and we'll go live from there. I might be able to pull some of them people. Oh, I would love to get Jeff. Jeff's, Jeff Munch Jeff is going to be there. Jeff Munch is going to be there. We'd yeah. love to pull him on the live stream with us. Yeah. Maybe. Cool. We'll that'd see. Cool. We'll see. Um, but, uh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Again, thank yeah. you for coming. You we amazing. really do appreciate it. We love sharing this information. And you guys had really great questions along the way, too. <clears throat> yes. Which I This love. makes it 
fun. This is why I like this it makes us fun is we dig into this and ask questions. And it, and it's fun that you guys have, you know, are questioning things that we would question, and it, it's just, I love it. Yes, love great it. discussions, yeah. great stuff. Yeah. Love the Behind the Hauntings. So when you see us say, hey, we're going to do a Behind the Haunting on a Thursday, that's this is what those videos are about. So, All right, guys. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thanks for watching. And happy hunting. If you like this episode of Behind the Haunting, make sure you hit that like button and leave us a comment below. Also, if you'd like to see more videos from Panic D videos in the future, Make sure you subscribe and ding that bell so you get notified the next time we post a video or go live.